Hello detectives, I'm excited to announce and introduce our YouTube membership tiers. You can support the channel by choosing one of the five membership options which come with some perks such as MMO Rarity Detective Badges, your name in the credits, and more. But it really is more about supporting what we do here on the channel and allowing us to continue to do it and more, while not having to take those unscrupulous deals or sponsors to keep the channel, which is my living, alive. Thanks for the continued support, detectives. Batman and a MOBA. That's it. That's the tagline. Okay, well, it was more than just that. You had the whole cast of the Justice League present, as well as a plethora of other lesser-known DC characters and versions, both equally fun and goofy, that would do battle on a number of maps against an enemy team 5 vs 5. Heroes vs Villains. Innovation is not often what the biggest franchises are seeking when they target a market they don't normally target, which made a MOBA a theoretically perfect pick for the pioneer MMORPG developer Turbine Games of Lord of the Rings Online and Asheron's Call of Fame. Take the tried-and-true MOBA format, add some Batman paint to it, and theoretically, you'd have a hit. At least, that was probably the basic idea behind it. Infinite Crisis of Free-to-Play MOBA launched in March of 2015 and had one of the fastest deaths as a game in this series. Despite this fact, the game has had some unmistakable charm and interesting characters and playstyles we haven't yet seen in a MOBA. On this episode of Death of a Game, we take a look at the short-lived mystery of the death of the DC MOBA, Infinite Crisis. Pay attention to the clues along the way, and at the end we will put them all together for the final deduction concerning the largest contributing factors to the death of a game, Infinite Crisis. To the Batmobile. Hello detectives, I would like to welcome a new sponsor to the Noir Club. NordVPN has joined in supporting our endeavors and sponsored this video. If you don't know what NordVPN is, it's one of the leading VPNs or virtual private networks in general. NordVPN can hide your IP, allow you to access content with certain geo or school blocking, and allow us to visit some of those unscrupulous websites. I mean you. Well, you know the ones. Point being, maybe you're just paranoid about people seeing your IP address. And that's fair. NordVPN can help you there. Most importantly, if you are a content creator, streamer, or play games in general, you can protect from DDoS attacks and potentially get a ping increase. Go to nordvpn.com slash nerdslayer or use code nerdslayer to get a two-year plan plus four months for free as a bonus gift with a huge discount. I currently use NordVPN as many other people do and haven't had any issues regarding the service and installation and use was easy and painless. Thanks for supporting the channel and thanks for sponsoring this video, NordVPN. All right, detectives, back to the video. The story starts back in 2013 upon the announcement by Warner Brothers, the rights holder of the DC franchise, that a free-to-play MOBA dubbed Infinite Crisis, based on the Infinite Crisis DC comic books published back in 2005, was in production, a key theme of the series being alternate characters and universes. Infinite Crisis would be developed by Turbine, a pioneer in the world of online gaming, but the first time that they would be attempting a non-MMORPG. Writing for Engadget at the time, MJ Guthrie would have a hands-on with the DC MOBA Infinite Crisis. The coverage was rather positive, as the reviewer highlighted the unique environmental interactions and destruction capable in the game, quite apropos for a superhero game. Infinite Crisis would have a private closed beta May 8th, 2013, where many critics got the chance to play the game and give their impressions. Unless invited, in order to get access to the beta, you had to purchase a Founders Pack, which Turbine had brought to the world of MOBAs now. Different levels of packs grant different levels of rewards, but the beta access itself was already a huge reward and incentive for players. FOMO or fear of missing out is a factor, but you have to think that there are already show matches happening and the big publisher behind a big pioneer developer in Turbine, players understandably were predicting a possible pro or competitive scene and wanted to be a part of it early. This is not how League of Legends did it. I repeat, this is not how League of Legends did it. This is kind of where you should have copied them, right? League of Legends had the ingenious idea of limiting the access to their betas to only the weekends and only during select weekends. So basically people would have something to look forward to, something to look forward to testing, even if it was still in its early phases. League of Legends was able to create an organic community this way. They weren't merely a high-profile ripoff of Dota, and they took many, many years to build their audience to scale. Dota came from a community mod in Warcraft 3, 
Turbine was relying heavily on hype and name recognition to get a player base in a rather artificial way by contrast. The core gameplay loop was typical MOBA-style combat and progression, where you picked a character to play each map in a 5 vs 5 PvPVE style map. Actually, speaking of the map in Infinite Crisis, or maps I should say, which is impressive for a newly launched MOBA, are also tied to the game mode or the way you play the map effectively. For example, on Gotham Divided you had the very typical 5 vs 5 defeat the enemy team's base to win. But with Gotham Heights, it was effectively Dominion, an old retired League of Legends mode where you had multiple cap points and then a center cap point as well to contend with. The final map, not counting the 1 vs 1 tutorial map of sorts, was Coast City, another 5 vs 5 map with a few more unique map aspects, but generally the same sort of ideas present in most MOBAs with the jungle creeps and the like. Although the impression from other critics mimicked the general positivity of Engadget's coverage, there was an unmistakable feeling that Infinite Crisis felt like a response to a trend. The issue so early on noticeable with Infinite Crisis was it was basically designed to mimic League of Legends. Hell, even the gold amount you get for killing an enemy hero or villain in the game is the same. Maps, as already discussed, were not really unique besides the environmental destruction aspects. With a powerful IP such as DC, sometimes doing something unique or even necessarily better isn't really even needed to generate a fanbase. But by 2013, League of Legends, Dota 2, Smite, and other still-living MOBAs had already been dominating the space for a time, and had large amounts of market share. If Turbine wanted to rival one of these, and just attempt to shave off a few of those percentages of the market share from one of the titans, it was going to be a hotly contested battle in a very competitive genre. They were going to need the full backing of Warner Brothers and the DC name to compete with the likes of Riot and Valve. But as we've already learned on this series, name recognition alone, the Batman or not, it very likely isn't enough to keep a game afloat. What was unique about Infinite Crisis besides being a MOBA in the superhero universe was the multiple versions to each iconic superhero. This meant that alternative universe versions of heroes would be present and would present different gameplay styles. For example, Joker was obviously present in the game, but not just Joker. You also had the Atomic Joker, the Marksman version of the Joker. You had Gaslight Joker, the Enforcer aka Tank version, and so on and so forth. According to the creative director, Cardale Kerr at Turbine, the ultimate idea was six different versions per champion. This would prove to be a rather controversial decision, as many fans of the DC world might recognize some of the alternative universe characters, but would most players and people elsewise? Adding a bunch of alternative universe characters to artificially create some sort of balance or champion roster seemed to be a quite risky strategy for an otherwise by-the-books MOBA. Infinite Crisis already so early in the story would fail its expectations and not launch in 2013. Instead, there would be an announcement of an open beta for the new title the next year in February of 2014. Along with the announcement was a launch of a newly weekly digital comic series titled Infinite Crisis, as well as a number of action figures like this Atomic Poison Ivy or this Harley Quinn in pajamas. PC Games would do a piece on Infinite Crisis in May of 2014 where they would state that Turbine was attempting to build the game with a soul of its own, which of course is probably what they should be saying. But when you're also in the same article admitting to consulting with a pro League of Legends team in your development, well like get your point, but optics kind of matter. I mean you pick the worst League of Legends team, okay I'm just kidding. But I think that the point is more that the influence that League of Legends had on Infinite Crisis at this point was just impossible to ignore. Layoffs would unfortunately hit Infinite Crisis developer Turbine in October of 2014, and with no launch seemingly in the future for Infinite Crisis in 2014 either. While it was reported that these layoffs were on the Lotro team, I can't confirm exactly if the Infinite Crisis team was or wasn't affected. Starting the new year with a bang in 2015, Infinite Crisis would have a show match series showcasing the game giving people more of a taste. The long-awaited now two years after the promised launch date, launch of Infinite Crisis would finally come sometime in March 2015. Infinite Crisis launched globally March 26, 2015 on Steam. Unfortunately, the Steam page for Infinite Crisis didn't survive the test of time either, and I'm unable to show the reviews and reception there. That being said, Steam Spite tells us that the game was 75% positively rated by players, which apparently only hit a maximum of 20,000 players. According to the aggregate review website Metacritic, Infinite Crisis would score a middling 68 out of 100 from 8 different critics. Not quite the superhero reception. 
GameSpot gave the game a 6 out of 10, and in their review of Infinite Crisis was glowing concerning the cast of characters, shorter match times, and few innovations that were brought to the table. But they were rather negative concerning the difficult to decipher UI present in the game and how imbalanced the game felt by comparison. Imbalance, you see, is no stranger to a MOBA title. It's a constant back and forth, teeter totter process, but Infinite Crisis had infinitely less practice and time in the oven than League of Legends and Dota, and that much was proving to be obvious. IGN was no more positive in their review, giving the title a 6 out of 10 and being most critical of something GameSpot and many other critics and players alike were having issues with, the population. Well, specifically lack of population, which meant that only one game mode or map, Coast City, was playable. Players might have really enjoyed the other two modes, the ones that we've mentioned before, but due to the fear of those queues not being good enough and perhaps an issue of balance, player base wise, Turbine would lock those queues and focus all efforts on the Coast City map. Why not resort to bots if you already knew this was going to be an issue so early on? Even early League of Legends had bots that you could play against, and Infinite Crisis lacked proper AI to queue against to enjoy the modes that players were unable to play. As far as we know and have been told by critics and those who have had their hands on Infinite Crisis early on, Infinite Crisis was designed with Gotham divided as the primary mode, the very typical MOBA-style map. But what does it tell you when Turbine was unwilling to rely on this as their main game mode ultimately? It tells me that there wasn't enough confidence in their design, and thus the game. In Gotham Heights, I mean, Dominion was a failed League of Legends mode for a reason, and that's not just selection bias either. Riot even tried to reboot it themselves and failed. Not very likely that Turbine, who had no MOBA experience, was going to be able to pull it off either. If Infinite Crisis only had enough population to run one mode at launch, the theoretical height of its hype and popularity to an extent was insanely limited. The future wasn't looking too good for the superhero MOBA. A kiss of death for an online game, especially so early on, one with such a powerful IP, is a dead player base. It looks like in the end, the heroes were unable to stave off the game's destruction, and Warner Brothers announced the shutdown of Infinite Crisis on June 4th, 2015, announced mere two months after the launch. Straight out of Gotham, it was a rather cryptic announcement. No reason was stated for the shutdown of the game, other than it was based on a difficult decision and the targeted shutdown date was supposed to be August 14th, 2015, just six months after the game originally launched. Due to the Steam page being brought down, we are unable to track the player counts for Infinite Crisis, but according to this article, at the time, they announced that the shutdown peak player base for Infinite Crisis was a humble 1,557 players, with a total peak for the game at 6,921 players back in March. For an indie project, these numbers are enough to keep your game and company afloat. For Turbine, recently acquired by Warner Brothers, paying for an expensive DC license and a two-year delayed launch, these numbers weren't good enough. The mythical, magical DC Universe name recognition and the support that was supposed to come with it never really came. Similar to Marvel Heroes, which we also covered on this series, the name recognition and backing of one of the largest entertainment franchises wasn't enough to compete with the likes of the tried and true MOBA players in the marketplace. But I don't know if it's entirely fair to say it wasn't ever possible. I find Warner Brothers' support of Infinite Crisis to be like many other corporate pet projects, where it's a spin-off by nature not necessarily expected to wow the crowd or anything, but expected to grab a little bit of market share. Still, when the expectations weren't satisfied, Warner Brothers wasn't keen to stick around and foot the bill for any mistakes, or the time required to further polish and keep Infinite Crisis alive. Effectively, they didn't want to keep spending money and waiting. Especially when the population, and potentially the founder packs, which they could have used to gauge success in a way, to start, were already so low. In a sense, it's almost a curse to get the name recognition of a famous brand, but not the proper support, especially relative to the market. Competing with the likes of Valve and Riot takes serious dollars. We're talking hundreds of millions, potentially. Throwing the DC name on Infinite Crisis without the full support of the franchise doomed the game from the start. The gameplay itself was never meant to wow anybody. It took a tried and true format and added a few improvements. The strengths of Infinite Crisis was going to have to come from the IP it was based on. To be completely fair though, perhaps the Infinite Crisis merchandise and media didn't do well elsewhere, and maybe Warner Brothers cut their losses to an extent, but I think it's more of a matter of not knowing your market and how much it's going to take to be competitive in it, even if you just want to be a small player. Infinite Crisis would shut down August 14th, 2015, a mere half year after it originally launched. And as of 2021, there are no efforts to reboot the game or a community server. 
So we've reached the end of our journey in this video, but we still have a case that we need to close before we go. Before we get to the final deduction where we compile all the necessary clues along the way to deduce the greatest contributing factors in the death of a game, Infinite Crisis, let's talk about one element of Infinite Crisis that was not so immediately noticeable, especially if you didn't play the game. That's concerning the game's engine or performance. We don't ultimately know what engine they used to make Infinite Crisis, but one thing is for sure when compared to the gameplay experiences present in either League of Legends or Dota, it left something to be desired. Infinite Crisis might be the superhero League of Legends, but it's not the same gameplay or engine, and that's quite apparent when you look for things like visual clarity and clarity of animations, which are both lacking in the game. And you can see that quite clearly in a team fight, just watching one. The graphics themselves, while I'm personally a fan of, aren't typically as impressive as you would expect from a superhero game. One that you would expect would have more, you know, superhero visuals. One of my favorite songs, and every detective's favorite part of the job, and the video. Let's crack the case, guys. Infinite Crisis lacked game engine polish and visual design for being a superhero MOBA. Multiple alternate DC Universe characters was disjointed and confusing for the audience. Turbine lacked the experience in making non-MMORPGs. Lack of population killed two of the three game modes out of the gate. Warner Brothers never pulled their heavy weight to compare with the likes of Riot and Valve. Infinite Crisis won't have the same positive fanbase or legacy another ill-fated superhero spin-off title in this series Marvel Heroes had, but it does join the ranks of yet another title with a popular IP, attempting to respond to a trend and being just a little bit too late in the process to do that. I know it's easy for many people watching to dismiss Infinite Crisis if you did or didn't play it as another MOBA clone, but I didn't think that ultimately that's why the game failed. That's why I chose it in the series. Sometimes games are a near blatant copy of other games, or inspired by, and go on to be more successful than the original. Sometimes, as said in the very beginning of this video, just being good enough with the right support and well-known established universe could be good enough to thrive in the marketplace. But Infinite Crisis, much like the other DC forays, not the more recent Justice League, Aquaman, or the Doom Patrol series, think the Superman movies, was another failure but a titan like DC can afford to have these failures and put their eggs in many different baskets. Sometimes they hatch, sometimes they don't. I myself have high hopes for a superhero online video game, not only because I enjoy the ones that have launched thus far, flawed or not, I look forward to seeing what is capable in the future if we can learn from these past failures and make the appropriate improvements. The literal concept of a superhero online game seems built into building an alter ego online, or avatar character as people call them, to play as in an MMORPG. There's so much potential there, and it's just a matter of someone harnessing that power. We've already seen the potential with the still kicking pioneer superhero MMO, City of Heroes. Thanks for watching, guys. When the asteroid struck, it remade our world.